days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall feast in the table spread for me. Truly goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. When I walk through the dark, lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there. And safely His great hand will lead me to the mansion He's gone to Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the land forever and I shall feast at the table spread for me surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days all the days of my life all the days all the days of my life you may be seated. this book to stay or <laughs> the page to say my uh, my kids like when I sang this song a couple weeks ago and I didn't do such a good job but I'm gonna try it again they seem to be singing this song quite often lately and I enjoy listening to my kids sing it's a blessing when you get a chance to sing and all of a sudden those songs get caught up into their head it reminds you that even children can have a song for the Lord amen what can wash away my sins Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that glow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. But the blood of Jesus For my part in this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this I plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is that blow That makes me white as snow no other fount I know Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Jesus Not for good that I have done Nothing but the blood of Jesus us. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power. Oh, in nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I've got a, a numerous amount of books that are on my bookshelf in the basement of my home that touch on the subject of finances. Now, you may not think that that's a big thing. And somebody says, well, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The Bible doesn't say that it wouldn't be a bad thing for Christians to have money. <laughs> Never says that. Here's the problem with money, and I've said this on numerous occasions, and for those of you that maybe haven't joined us on Sunday evenings, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't mean to have money is evil. What the Bible is saying is, where there is evil, you can guarantee that money is at the root of it. It's a guarantee. And a lot of Christians have this idea, oh, I don't, I don't need to be you know, financially adept. I don't need to worry about if i got enough money in the bank to pay my bills. God will just take care of it. Folks, it's your responsibility to make sure that you keep up with all your things. You want to talk about the story of the talents? We could talk about that. That's money, by the way. Now, you could, you could refer that to other things like spiritual gifts or talents, but the point of it is, is that God expects you to keep up with what's yours. And then he goes on in that scripture by saying this, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I have made thee something over a little. I'm going to make you a ruler over many things now. You see, in order for you to be able to handle making $1,000 a week, you've got to start off at least making 10 shoveling driveways. You know, I didn't see any kids out shoveling driveways this last couple of weeks. All the snow out there, by the way, I... When I did the sidewalk out there, I felt like it was at least worth 50. Y'all be paying them kids a little bit more than that. That ice was thick, I'm here to tell you. But a lot of people will say, well, where do I get financial understanding from? As a matter of fact, you can get it from the Word of God. In Proverbs chapter 27, I want to look from 23, verse 23 through verse 27. The Bible says, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. Listen to what it says in verse 24. For the riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and the herbs of the mountain are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goats milk enough for thy flood, for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of thy maidens, let us go to the Lord in prayer. My Heavenly Father, we pray you be with the service this hour, that you'd fill it, and that you would allow it to help us grow in knowledge and wisdom, better understanding your word and the expectation of the Christians, those that have professed your Son Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the expectations that you have set on us in overseeing our own herds and our flocks, our finances, and making sure that we're not acting foolishly nor ignorantly, Father, according to the Word of God, when it comes to rendering ourselves and our finances. May we, Father, be blessed in this hour, and may you watch over us and be with us. We thank you for all that you've done, and pray you forgive me of my sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, for his sake. Amen. Now, I learned before the service this morning that Cadence thinks I'm the president. <laughs> now, I can tell you, Cadence, I don't get paid like a president. I've heard the president of the United States makes around $400,000 a year an annual salary, okay? 
Now, one thing I do want to do is edify Donald Trump a little bit and the fact that did you realize that he only took a dollar a year in his payment when he took office? Matter of fact, he's one of the only presidents in the, in the course of history that has gone into the, to the establishment of being a president rich and come out a little bit less richer. What does that mean, Brother Joe? It means that he went in, have established himself, yes, as a billionaire, but when he exited his office after four years in his term, guess what? He was actually worth less than he was when he went in. And you can look this up, but every quarter he would donate the majority of his salary to charitable causes. Now, I'm getting a lot of feedback up here, brother. You good? Okay. And somebody says, well, why is that important? Because it goes to show you that he is the type of person that was able to handle that type of income. He could understand it. He knew what to do with it. He knew where to move it. There was this question, this debacle for a while there during some of the debates. He said, we want to see your tax returns. You're going to release your tax returns. How much did you pay in taxes? And he said, millions of dollars. They said, release the tax returns. Well, I got, I've got news for you. His tax returns wouldn't show that he paid millions of dollars in taxes. You want to know why? The people that are asking those questions, I dare say, especially those in the middle class that are asking those questions viciously in a term to an attack that man, you got to consider this. They're not giving away millions of dollars for charitable causes. I wonder how many people are giving maybe tens or hundreds of dollars in charitable causes. You see, the rich understand some things that maybe we don't. And I'm not saying that every rich man is knowledgeable and doing things the right way. And I'm not saying Donald Trump has. By all means, he's made his mistakes. I'm never going to advocate that he was the righteous, the, the righteous man that everyone claimed that he, bit, he, he was. He made quite a few mistakes. Excellent president. And you can look at it just from his policies. But as any other man, he makes mistakes. But one thing he did really well was handle his finances. And somebody says, boy, if I had a job making $400,000 a year, I'd spend it on this and that and this. But you see, God put a man in place, and he was able to understand what to do with that. So I wonder how many of us are doing well with our finances. As a matter of fact, one of my mentors, Jim Rome, as I was in college, and I've mentioned him a couple of times when I talked to you all on Sunday evening. When I began to look him up, I found out that he had died from a lung disease. I was actually interested in meeting him or going to one of his uh, mentorship programs as a college student. By the time I got a hold of his material and found out where he was, he was dead. He's buried in Glendale, California. Major impact on my life. He began to test my knowledge and to teach me things that I had never been taught, even in my own home family. And I loved my parents, but they weren't very good with their money. And he said that there was a guy that he met by the name of Earl Schof. And Earl Schof said, Jim... I've spent about two hours with you, and I bet, I bet, we don't bet as Christians, but he says, I bet, he didn't bet money. He said, but I bet I can bet, I can guess your bank account within around $300. And Jim Rome said, I was astonished at the idea that this man could get anywhere that close. He said, I bet he's off. So Jim said, okay, I'll tell you what. You tell me what you think is my bank account, and I'll tell you if you're right on around $300. And he said he got it almost correct. He said he actually margin it, marginalized it with $125. He was that close. Now, that may not say a whole lot to you, but it said a whole lot to him. He said, you mean that you can spend two hours with somebody and almost, you can almost guess what's in their bank account? Well, let me put it to you this way. I bet I can go to the homes of some people, and I could be there for about two hours, and I'm not putting anybody down. But what I'm saying is there are attributes physically that you can see. I could go to someone's house. And I can say, I know you're working on a stimulus check. There's nothing wrong with that. You get to live with life whichever way you choose. Life is of your choosing is what Jim Rome says. Life is of your choosing. But he also taught some great financial lessons. And what's funny is a lot of the things that he applied to his teachings came from where? Where do you think it came from? The Bible. A lot of people don't realize the sustenance, the substance that's inside of the word of God according to finances. We looked at financial freedom for the present. I'm going to touch on this again. Proverbs 27 says this in verse number 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. What does that mean? Make sure you're looking at your finances. Make sure you're keeping up with the things that you've got going on. Hey, can you guess who's looking at your finances if you aren't? Nobody. Except for Coke and... Netflix and the grocery store and your loan officer, your mortgage, they're making sure they're getting theirs. But I know so many people that'll write a check and boop, it'll bounce. Why? Because they're not keeping up with their own finances. They can't seem to get it 
together, organizationally. The Bible says you need to what? Verse 23, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. So we are to know the state of our, of our flocks and to look well on the management of our own income. And in Proverbs 27, verse 27, it says, it is that there is enough for our own needs. Look at that. And thou shalt have goats, milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance of thy maiden. Somebody says, it's talking about goats, Brother Joe. I know what it's talking about. And when Jesus Christ was talking about seeds, he wasn't talking about physically planting little seeds either. A lot of the things that we get are fleshly or worldly stories that have a spiritual meaning to your life, an application to you. This is the application that's being used thereof. So I talked about planning a budget, what you need to do with that, and how to be sure that you can maintain that. Here's one of the things that's really, really sad about Christians, and I want to touch on this real quick as we continue to go forward. All the advice I've given thus far and all the things in Scripture that God has given thus far to help you along the way of your financial freedom means nothing if you don't get this one thing right. Don't you want to know what that secret is? Hey, if I had a secret, I told you, if you do this for sure, you're going to be okay. How many do you want to know? Well, you got to come back next Sunday. We're going to close service, okay? No! Malachi chapter 3. The book of Malachi is the very last book of the Old Testament. To give you an idea of where it's at, right before the book of Matthew... You want to know the secret? Amen? Don't you want to know? Thank you. Cadence is raising her hand. Yes, I'd like to know. What's the secret? Tell me, Mr. President. <laughs> Malachi, chapter 3, verse number 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from mine ordinances. And have not kept them, return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Isn't that just like God? You know what God says? God says this, return to me, and then I'll return to you. There's this implication in the word of God that says this, if you draw nigh unto me, it's another way of him saying, if you'll come to me, then I will come to you. You know what that means? If there's separation between you and God, you can't say, God, come back to me. You've neglected my ordinances, and look what he says at the end of that verse. But ye said, wherein shall we return? You know what modern day terms that is? What for? Why? What a silly question. Here's what the Bible says. Will a man rob God? How many of you would dare rob God? I mean sincerely. Think about this. So now somebody says, well, I've never seen this verse before. You mean there's actually a way that you can steal from God? Yeah. You can rob him. How so? What for? Why? Where have you robbed God? Yet ye have robbed me. This is God talking in the first person, by the way. Listen closely. Ye, that's you all, not actually you all, but he's speaking in pluralisms here, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? He says, hey, You've robbed me in your tithes and offerings. You've robbed me. I watch you every day go to work. I gave you that job. You can take care of your family, and then you can take vacations. You pay for your water bill, your electric bill. You've got internet. You get to play video games. You get to go out with your girlies and get your nails done. You get to go out with the guys and have a good time on the golf course. And you spend all that money. And all the luxury you have, and yet you've robbed me. How so, God? You've neglected your tithes and your offerings. Some people say, well, I know a lot of people that do really well, and they never tithe. They may do well financially, but I bet they're poor in a lot of other areas in their life. Very poor. Matter of fact, I know a lot of miserable people I don't like to be around. But the only thing I 
It's void. Poor in the relationships, poor in the marriage, poor in the friendships, poor in the work relationships, poor in the attitude. Everything's poor about them. And they got all the money in the world, and they're just, there's not even walk in the room, and it just feels like the air is sucked out of the room. You go, difficult. But they got all the money they want. Somebody says, you want to know the secret? Here's the secret. over and churches are just they're just horrible about wanting to get money they're horrible about that no folks if i really want you to be ahead in life and i want you to do well and i do want you to do well and i love you very much i'm not just saying this because it benefits me or the church i'm not saying it for those reasons i'm saying it because it benefits you because there's separation between you and god in your finances no wonder you can't get ahead and you and your husband or your wife, you just can't seem to get along. Every time you look at the end of the month, there's bills piled up. Can't figure it out. What's going on? You know the number one reason for divorce in America? Can you guess? Thank you. The youngest, the, listen, probably the youngest married couple in the room, guess what they said? Now, how do they know that? Do you think God's going to bless your marriage if you've robbed him? Think about that. You rob him. It'll be okay. We'll get by. We'll get through. No, not at all. In all things, everything that we've discussed over the course of the last five, six, seven weeks, however long we've been on this topic, you've missed it all if you missed this one mark. You can do everything else I told you to do. Fine. No problem. Do everything else the Bible tells you to do. No problem. But you've robbed him. And when you rob God, don't you think that God's going to get his? He'll get it. You know what the Bible says about rich men? God allows them to have it, and all the while, he's laying it up in store for the righteous. I believe that to be true. I really do. They're just holding it for a little while, miserable and all of it, can never find happiness in it, and all of a sudden, something happens to them, and it falls into the hands of righteous men. I believe that because the Bible says it. Not all of it, but just for a season, they've got it. There's things we could talk about as far as prioritizing your budget and setting your budget, making sure you follow your budget, being agreed upon your budget. All those things would be important. I could go on to talk about practices you could do. There's things like Dave Ramsey says. You could put $50 back in an envelope somewhere and create an emergency fund, and all that would be just great. You, want, you do whatever you feel need, you're led to do. But above all things, you've got to keep an eye on your finances. If you're married, listen, couples, you've got to agree and work together on it. Otherwise, you're working against one another on it. You're either working together or you're not. There's no in-between. You've got to le let each other know. <clears throat> to get ahead on things in a marriage, you work together. You want to know why? Because the Bible says you're no longer twain. You know what twain means? You're no longer divided. You're not your own person any longer. That's the magnificence of marriage. I'll never truly understand it that my wife and I, if she was on the opposing side of the planet, we could have thousands of miles between us. As far as I'm concerned, she could be on the other side of the galaxy, floating away and never
what we do as best friends, we talk about our bank finances. There isn't anything. I'm not kidding you. There are times that she'll call up and tell me I'm super busy here. Right now. But I say, would you like to order like three dollars? Three dollars? Why? Get it? Maybe it's two dollars. I don't know. But the point is, is that we talk about those things. Before we make a decision, whether it's buying a house or getting a car, we talk through it. We talk about some things right now financially. Always having that conversation. You must work effectively together and keep each other up. Uh, South Central, forget we had, it was a specific mortgage company at that time, but I bring it inside and come to find out that that was the year that they look over your loan to see if your escrow amount is on or off, and they said, hey, by the way, we overestimated your escrow account for this year's taxes and come to find out your taxes are about $450 lower than they, we estimated, so we're going to give that back to you, and on, on, you flip the little lid down, there's this check, it has my name on it, I had to go, and guess what, lights were paid. Now the bills were paid, and we went to Texas Roadhouse. It's just like God to take care of you. There is really something about it. And I'm not saying it's going to happen for you all the time, but what I'm saying is, is that God knows what you have a need of. God knows it. He says, I know you have a need of raiment and clothing and all those things. I know that you have a need for those things. He's fully aware of it. If God can tend to the birds and see the uh, sparrow fall and feed them, he knows that you have a need of the things that you need. He knows it. It's for us to recline that faith on him in our finances and say, Lord, I'm not going to rob you, and I'm just going to follow you. And maybe it doesn't happen for you overnight, but maybe in a couple of years you start to realize that God's opening up doors for you, and you just there's these things that just kind of happen in your life. And I can share a little story with you about, and again, I've talked about chip games. I've talked about his wife, Joanna, games. When they were in college, they got married. It was like six months they were dating. They got married. And she had this decision. She's like, I want to go to New York, and I want to learn to be a, a journalist. And what was interesting was she took this risk to go to New York to be a journalist. And while she's down there, she's seeing all these shops on the street, these decor shops. And she had this little innate feeling like, I really want to do that. I feel like I'm do well at that. And she comes home, and her husband Chip is running these businesses. And he's got this little business called Magnolia. He's got the real estate buying small properties and fixing them up. And all of a sudden, she says, Chip, I want to help you with that. She says, well, I'll just do it. So they start, and they had a really rough time doing it at first. I don't know why they couldn't group eat. Chip thought he had it figured out. She's coming in. He's like, well, I didn't realize at that time is that she was going to be the most crucial part of my business. My wife was. He said, here I was trying to bat against her. And she's trying to help me along the way. And she was the greatest asset that I had. And all of a sudden, she realized that it was my best friend right next to me the whole time we worked together in this business. How amazing is that? She got involved in the business literally exploded. There was a school for design, just something that she naturally did. But God, he said, you can see how God orchestrated all these things. And he mentions that numerously in his testimony. How God did this, and God did that, and God did this. And where they used to struggle and couldn't pay bills, now they've got 55,000 guests a day in Waco, Texas. And Lord knows how much money that they're making. But the best part about it is, if you look at some of the things they're doing, they're giving so much back to their community. And they're able to do that because they have faith 
God says, well done, you've done well with what I've given you. This small amount, I'm going to give you a little bit more. Then he says, hey, great, you've done well. And you're going to go through tribulation. You know the Bible says about tribulation? Tribulation work is experience. You don't grow by having it easy. You grow through the hard times. And the best part about it is that if my wife and I fell on our face tomorrow financially, and we had to move out of our house and get a little apartment, guess what, honey, I have to do this with you. I've done it before, I do it again. I'm okay with that. I'm not afraid to be around my family and to fail and cry all over because one of my greatest memories in our lives was roughing it together. And I think that's why a lot of marriages fail because when marriages come together and they're in their 30s and they're well established, they got their own bank accounts, their own jobs, their own cars, their own way of living. So they try to come together and make it all mesh and work. It doesn't work that way. And then things happen, they have it hard. They're like, well, I didn't expect it to be this hard. I'm done with you. Pity on you. You grow into tribulation. Tribulation work is experience. Experience hope. And hope, guess what? Love. Isn't that true? It could be more true, I know, because I didn't make that up. I got from the Word of God. Can we all agree that we can work together? Can we all agree that we're not to rob God? I don't advocate for you to tithe because it benefits me. That's not what I'm doing. I've said this before and I'll say it again. The Lord had me here and I was able to take this position and I didn't do it for the money. I never have. That's not why I've been called to preach. Matter of fact, I had someone tell me in Enterprise, you're going to preach? There's no money in that. <laughs> you know what I said? You ought to see my retirement plan. You ought to see my retirement plan. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Guess what? All these things have been added unto you. It's okay for you to have money, folks. But do yourself a favor. Make sure, make sure that your money never has. Because God said it would happen. Brooks, it is a privilege to talk about finances. I have other pieces of literature that I can give you. I have some advice that I can give you. The greatest advice I can give you is don't rob God. That's it. That's the secret. All things after this. Don't rob him. Don't. I promise you, if you rob God, the thing about God, when you rob him, like the people that robbed this building over here, this shed, I have no idea who it was. I don't. You know who knows who it was? God does. You can't really rob him. Now, we know the Bible says you can, and you can. It's your own choice. But when you do it, you do it knowing that he knows you've done it. And you will receive the punishment for the reward of robbing God. Not a punishment I would like to see. So, therefore, when you, when you take your finances, give it to God first, set it aside, and make him Lord over that account. Brother, if you'll come. Sister, if you'll come. Doing good tonight. We're closing 15 minutes early to get you all home. Amen. Now somebody buy me a sandwich and bring it back here before we leave, okay? It's been a blessing to be with you all. I love you. I thank you for a great day that you've invested. And I would highly recommend for any of you that are here that have been affected by the financial study that we've done and you take into consideration what God has laid on your heart, please make it a point to implement all the things that God has asked you to do according to his word. Now I can promise you that it's not going to happen overnight. I, here's what I can say. You get to hit where you are financially if you're in a bad position overnight. It just happen like that. You made some poor decisions, mundanely, methodically, of the monotony of things, it happens slowly, and the decision to change it can happen overnight, but you're not going to get to that destination overnight. It's going to take time. So don't point your finger at God in a week and say, hey, I gave tithes and offerings. I don't recommend that. Not a class I tithe for. You just remember it took you a long time to get where you are. It's going to take you a, quite a while to get out. But the good part is you can change directions overnight, and the course is drastic. Not the blowing of the wind that determines your destination. It's not. The same economical wind that sold the wind, the psychological wind, the same political wind that blows on all of us, blowing on you and your family's 